trafficking prostituted children happens everywhere, everywhere. I've never been in a community where something isn't going on. It's not easy if you have a pimp to just say, okay, enough is enough, I'm gone. It doesn't happen like that. Women lose their lives walking away. So when we see them as truly victims instead of criminals, then we begin to interact with them in ways that are more caring and more understanding. How do you deal with somebody that's not happy to see you, that's deceptive, uncooperative, maybe outright hostile? That's the challenge to law enforcement. That's the challenge to police officers. This is a crime that is happening every day here. Every day there's recruitment, multiple times over. Every day that there, there's another woman or young lady being victimized through sexual exploitation. The more you know about sex trafficking, the more you can do to identify and help victims and stop those who exploit them. This video will give you a basic awareness of what sex trafficking is and why it's such an important issue for all of us to understand. It's an issue that has received a lot of attention, but it's very different than most people realize. Sex trafficking occurs when one person obtains another to sell them for sex in exchange for money or something of value, such as food, shelter, or drugs. Sex trafficking is essentially prostitution involving a third person, usually a trafficker or pimp. Through its groundbreaking safe harbor law, Minnesota has taken an aggressive stand to protect young people, the most vulnerable victims of this crime. These are kids that are maybe stigmatized or already separated from their peer group, and that makes them more susceptible to being recruited by a trafficker, by someone who's going to try to make them, trick them into feeling that they are special. Sex trafficking is just one form of sexual exploitation, which also includes stripping, pornography, and survival sex. Trafficking doesn't have to involve crossing state or national borders. And under state law, there's no requirement that traffickers use force or coercion against their victims. Victims may even seem to consent, but that's not a defense. People think of sex trafficking as being something where, where uh, you know, women are being brought from overseas or there's like a gun being held to their head or whatever else. Um, and that's simply not true. Under Minnesota law, sex trafficking is simply obtaining somebody for the purposes of prostituting them. The trafficking part is, is exchanging sex for, for something else. Trafficking is big business. A single victim may easily generate $10,000 a month and the trafficker keeps it all. Even though pimping is often glamorized in popular culture, the reality is that traffickers are criminals who sell vulnerable people. Traffickers are people that are willing to, for whatever reason, they're willing to use uh, coercion, violence, lies, sometimes love as a tool to manipulate, to, to exploit and violate a victim. And, and it doesn't, skin color doesn't matter, age doesn't matter. Uh, we've had them come from uh, virtually uh, any walk of life, whether it's rural or urban or suburban across our state. Trafficking occurs just about everywhere, from homes and hotels to ice fishing houses and the Duluth Harbor. It occurs at truck stops, freeway hubs, and anywhere with an internet connection, making the problem as prevalent in greater Minnesota as it is in the Twin Cities. Our victims, they come from everywhere. Southeast Minnesota is, right now we're finding out, it's the pipeline between Chicago in the oil fields of North Dakota. We'll find our girls, we'll advertise all over. Uh, we're finding very transient, very here two days, three days at most if they're out from out of town and then they're gone. Cell phones, prepaid credit cards, and sites like Backpage.com make it easy for traffickers to do business anywhere in Minnesota. Social media, it's a place where they can hide. It's also a place where the recruitment happens. Eight years ago, online, if you're looking at um, Craigslist uh, or one of the other areas where you would find this type of activity, um, it was all confined into one general space, but now it's so prevalent that each city in the state or each geographic area has their own section within those websites. Sex traffickers are masters at mind games and manipulating victims into doing whatever they want. They do so through an emotional bonding process based on four T's, targeting, tricking, turning, and traumatizing.
Traffickers start by targeting young people who are already vulnerable. They may be on the run or estranged from their families, or may have disabilities or a history of molestation or abuse. Traffickers' pimps are very good at seeing the vulnerability in a child. They see the girl who's alone, they see the kid on the street on the corner, they see someone hanging around outside late at night, they see someone alone in the mall, they see the stress, they see the loneliness. Vulnerable victims can be found everywhere, at schools, at bus stops, and malls, and anywhere in the state with an internet connection. Social media has made it easier than ever to recruit young people. And that's where a lot of young people are, are meeting these guys and these suspects are grooming these young women before they even realize it. And we talk to a lot of young people and we ask the females, well, how'd you meet this person? I met him on Facebook. We arranged to meet at a certain location and that's how I met him. After contact is made, traffickers pretend to be interested in the victim romantically. Vulnerable victims may never have experienced this attention before. This young person is very flattered by the attention, flattered by being treated like an adult and, and being told, you're beautiful, I love you. And they're filling a, a niche somehow in the child's life that's missing. So it starts out usually very well, and then it turns. Once a young victim is emotionally bonded to her trafficker, he talks her into turning her first trick. For most victims, that first experience is devastating. People don't, I think, understand that the relationship between a trafficker and their victim is very much like a domestic violence relationship where a lot of power and control tactics are someone submissive. He brought me back to his house and I sat there with his son while he went to go run errands or something. And during that time, he had a friend who paid him for me to go have sex with him. I was afraid. I didn't really know what was going on. It was, I guess, a one-time thing. Um, and that's when the beatings start. Sex with strangers for money, with all of it paid to the trafficker, is a hellish experience. A victim will see five, 10, 20 men each day to meet a quota and avoid beatings. It's a miracle I'm alive. He would put gun, he played Russian roulette with me several times. He put a gun in my mouth. Victims are isolated from friends and family, both by the trafficker and by their own shame at what they are experiencing. For many, the continual abuse results in trauma bonding. Trauma bonding is very much like Stockholm Syndrome, which means that the victim attaches um, herself or himself to the, uh, the trafficker. And um, to the degree that even at, at the end of it all, they will still defend their trafficker. Another consideration is the fact that a majority of trafficking victims have been sexually abused as children, resulting in a history of unhealthy relationships. Rowena Matthews' early years were a blur, filled with neglect, rapes, and beatings, starting at age six when she was molested by a family member. When she and her brothers went to live with their grandparents in the small town of Litchfield, Minnesota, she thought she would be safe. We had a big old house to come to and could depend on my grandparents. Still coping with the effects of long-lasting abuse, she struggled with school and her life at home. When her estranged mother asked her to move in with her, Rowena thought it was a chance to start over. Well, then one day, my mom, she put the crack pipe to my mouth, and then she told me to go in the room with the older man that she was taking care of, and I performed oral sex on him for $35. So my mom became my pimp and my drug dealer. Her life centered around drugs and prostitution for at least 10 years. Her history with abusive men made her the perfect target for a trafficker. It was like love at first sight. He was beautiful. Um, he was caring, he was sweet. Then he started becoming abusive and manipulative. He was very narcissistic. I remember driving in the car with him and just him smacking me so hard because I wouldn't do what he asked me to do. And that day, I just remember seeing all my morals and values and standards fly out the window. For Rowena, every day brought an endless cycle of drugs, working the streets, and violence at the hands of her pimp. That 
right there made me know that the world wasn't safe and that I had no room for it and that I need to keep going on until somebody kills me or I kill myself. And that's how I lived. When Rowena herself became a mother, her childhood memories of abuse and abandonment came back. She made the difficult decision to seek help. Today, she is a champion for other victims of sex trafficking. This is Rowena, how may I help you? When Rowena looks back at her life, she's in awe of her biggest yeah. role of all, so survivor. I eventually graduated, and that was a beautiful moment because for the first time in my life, I got to wear a cap and gown. <laughs> and um, I got a certificate. And the certificate to me meant that I was human and that, that I'm loved, and that I'm worth something. Traffickers manipulate victims using sophisticated techniques. In order to know what to look for, it's crucial to understand the victim experience. Remember what that victim brings into that relationship, brings into that situation, into that contact with law enforcement. Everybody that they've ever trusted has betrayed them. Everybody that has told them, I'm going to take care of you, this is going to be a new beginning for you, has turned it around and has used that to exploit them. Victims of sex trafficking may already come with some history of trauma, whether it be in the form of neglect, um, sexual abuse, or physical, emotional abuse. So they already come with some form of trauma already. So that adds to the level of challenges that they experience coming into becoming a victim of sex trafficking. Victims may be vulnerable to traffickers for a variety of reasons. Risk factors include mental illness, a history of physical or sexual abuse, or drug abuse. Traffickers even target teens who are pregnant or have young children. Runaways and youth who are homeless or in the foster care system are at particular risk, as are youth who identify as gay or lesbian. There's a horrific number of kids who are turned away from home when their parents find out they're gay. And when you get on the street and you only have yourself, you sell yourself when you're hungry enough. So whether it's an LGBT youth or heterosexual youth, when you're hungry enough, you'll sell what you have. Sex trafficking may also look different in different communities. In the Hmong community, for example, traditional values may lead families to treat victims as outcasts. They are now um, seen as tainted. There's a great cultural stigma with that. So there's great shame that you've brought onto your family. And so you become quite ostracized by your family. You may be welcomed back into the home physically, but on a daily basis, these Hmong girls experience judgment, they feel shame, and they carry this great burden. Trafficking is a particular concern for Native youth, both on reservations and in other communities. They are being trafficked throughout our region, from ships in Duluth to the oil fields of North Dakota, to Minneapolis, where three-fourths of recent juvenile trafficking cases have involved Native victims. I think they're the perfect victim because, again, they have this mistrust of the systems and it's difficult for a lot of tribes or reservations to offer supportive services like you would see in the Twin Cities. So a lot of times you'll see people that come from outside of the reservation to take advantage of these people and if you don't have a jurisdictional authority over uh, someone that's you know just one city over, then it makes it very easy for them to come in and do what they want. Connecting with Native youth can present special challenges to systems professionals. Sometimes you're the first person that they're going to make contact with, and that, that first impression is going to make a, a big difference for them. Um, so if, if there's any way that you feel you could better yourself to addressing the issues that they're dealing with or understanding it, definitely do what you can to gain that education. The average age of recruitment for underage victims in any community is 13. Adolescent brains may not realize the dangers posed by a sophisticated trafficker intent on exploiting them. Any young person may be vulnerable when approached at the right time and in the right way. Being a trafficking victim is a traumatizing, dangerous experience. Victims experience repeated sexual assaults by buyers, control and manipulation by the trafficker, 
isolation from friends and family, and the constant threat of violence. They will do whatever they can to numb the pain. I see the experiences as being like a scar on the soul written in indelible ink that the world can't see. They may see behaviors. You might be using drugs as a, um, anesthetizing yourself when you're in street life. In the life, you may be acting out in different ways. Because of the manipulation and trauma they experience, victims may not act as we would expect. One of the biggest effects of trauma on a person's development is that they can't always trust when they're in danger or when they're not in danger. It throws off all of their coping skills. So we're, we're wired to know when we're in danger and that fight and flight kicks in. Well, for people who have been um, through a lot of trauma, they don't know what's traumatic and what's not. Everything feels traumatic to them. They don't know how to feel. Some will completely shut down. As a result, they are unlikely to ask for help, to report their own victimization, or even to see themselves as victims. They're afraid. They're afraid for themselves. They're afraid of, for their families. They're ashamed. Um, they feel or they've been led to believe by the victimizer that they won't be believed. They're led to believe by the victimizer that they themselves will be arrested or charged with a crime. They're led to believe by that victimizer that they're going to be seen as just being a bad person. Victims may be uncooperative or even angry and hostile. One of the most important things you can do is to just listen to her and gain her trust. It's about trust, and, and it takes time to build trust, but I know they might have to look at their own policies and their own procedures and see how they can slow that information gathering thing down a little bit and try not to rush it up because they have got to trust you before they get deep into that issue. Be patient. You have to look outside the box. Be prepared. You have to have a plan set up with every entity within your grasp. As someone on the front line of the sex trafficking issue, you have the opportunity to make a positive connection and establish a trusting relationship with the victim. It's not going to be easy, but in the long run, it's worth it. Coming up in the next video, identifying victims of sex trafficking, what makes victims vulnerable, resources and services for victims.